If you bury carbon dioxide 100 miles into the earth, heat it to 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit, squeeze it under pressures of 725,000 pounds per square inch, and then quickly rush it to the earth's surface to cool, you can create diamond, perhaps the most well-known carbon allotrope, the old-fashioned way. But this is the 21st century, and if genetic engineering and modern science has taught us anything, it's that humans are very good at synthetically replicating natural processes. A laboratory process called high pressure, high temperature can create a diamond in just a few days by compressing graphite and zapping it with electricity. This concept can even have a personal touch, and for $15,000, you can have a diamond made out of a lock of hair or cremated remains of a loved one. Conceivably, a more efficient process is called chemical vapor deposition, which can grow flawless diamonds overnight. The concept is similar to making a snowball. If you take a piece of diamond, you can add more and more carbon atoms to make a bigger diamond. This is done by placing a piece of diamond in a deep pressurizing chamber and heating it, along with natural gas, to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. In this way, the carbon from the gas breaks apart and becomes deposited on the diamond shard just like any other crystal growing process. So now you know how to make diamond, but what exactly is it? Well, diamond is an allotrope or form of pure sp3 hybridized carbon. Now don't be intimidated by that, it's just a fancy way of saying that it looks like this. But throughout school, I've had the phrase structure determines function engraved in my brain. So let's briefly talk about that. Diamond is the hardest naturally occurring material, and has earned a 10 out of 10 on the Mohs hardness scale. The reason for that is diamond's bonds, which are strongly covalent, and are arranged in a crystalline structure that is very rigid. Just about whatever you do, you can't cut diamond with something softer than it. For that reason, diamond cutting often requires diamond tools. Diamond is interestingly both the best thermal conductor and a very good electrical insulator. In terms of heat, this is because diamond forms that very rigid lattice structure that we've already talked about. As a result, photons, or little packets of energy that travel in waves, can easily zip through diamonds without running into too many atoms. The tightly packed structure also makes it easy for vibrations of heat energy to travel across the diamond crystal with ease. As to the electrical insulator aspect of diamond, the carbon atoms don't have any p orbitals or free electrons that can be dispersed to conduct electricity because they're all locked up in those four strong covalent bonds. Another interesting quality is that diamond is very thermally stable. To put this into perspective, house fires burn at around 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, and that temperature wouldn't bother a diamond in even the slightest of ways. Also, unless you're walking around on a 1292 degree Fahrenheit day, you don't have to worry about your diamond ring oxidizing. That's one reason why diamonds are so suited for jewelry. But what if you're in the market for a new diamond ring? What would you look for? Perhaps you've heard of the four C's of diamonds. Color, carrot, clarity, and cut. Diamond color is interesting because diamonds are actually clear in their pure state. But where do the colors come from? Much like finding colors in fluorite and other crystals, diamonds can be colored by impurities. For example, mix in a little boron and you'll get a little blue, a little nitrogen for a little yellow, and so on. Blue and red are the rarest colors, while yellow and brown are rather common. Diamond color is graded on a scale from D to Z, where D is colorless. Pricing colors is also a little tricky because it's often under discretion. A lightly colored pink diamond may be worth less than a clear one, but a vivid pink would likely increase the value. Carrot weight is probably a term that you're familiar with, but it's sort of an interesting funny name. Carrot. As awesome as it would have been, the first diamond merchants weren't rabbits. Instead, we need to go to the ancient Mediterranean region and look at their trees for the word's origin. The term carrot is actually a reference to the seeds of the carob tree. That's carob with a B, and not a T. Diamonds were weighed in relation to these seeds. However, as you may have foreseen, this was a flawed system because not all seeds are equal in mass, and merchants would often use heavier seeds when buying and lighter seeds when selling to maximize their profits. In other words, just like with cars, if you bought a diamond and tried to sell it 5 seconds afterwards, you'd be out a considerable sum of money. Today's carrot is a little more standardized, and is defined as 0.2 grams. In terms of rarity, only about one polished diamond out of a thousand weighs more than one carat. But that's not to say that large diamonds don't exist. The largest rough diamond, discovered in 1905 just outside of Pretoria, South Africa, is a Cullinan diamond, weighing in at 3,106 carats. Diamond clarity is the easiest of the four C's to understand, and it grades a diamond on internal characteristics called inclusions and surface blemishes which affect appearance. For example, a cloudy or grainy diamond is not as valuable as a pristine one without any imperfections. Clarity is graded on a scale of flawless to included. In my opinion, diamond cut, which refers to the quality of the cut and not the shape, is the most important C because it's what's responsible for the stone's sparkle, pop, and pizzazz. 
Diamond cutting is actually rooted in math and physics, and the goal is to use Snell's law to create total internal reflection. Snell's law is that the index of refraction of one material, which is a measurement of how easily light can travel through it, times the sine of its angle of incidence is equal to the index of refraction of material 2 times the sine of its angle of transmittance. Don't worry too much about the math now, it'll all make sense, I promise. Now, imagine a lake and a flashlight. Air has an index of refraction of 1, and water of 1.33. After doing the math, you'll find that if the flashlight shines down from the air into the water, light will always enter the water. But that is not the case the other way around. Since water's index of refraction is higher, meaning that light travels slower and therefore bends more, there comes a point, called the critical point, when a light shined upward from underwater never escapes the surface and therefore is never seen on land. In the case of water and air, that point is with 49 degrees of incident light. Now imagine a bucket of water with a hole near the bottom allowing the water to jet out. If you took a red laser and shined it through the hole in just the right way as to take advantage of the critical point, the light bounces off the surface, back into the water, off the bottom surface, back into the water, and so forth. Light never escapes the water because it's bouncing all around with total internal reflection, and now it looks as if the water stream is glowing red. Diamond has an index for a fraction of 2.417, which is coincidentally the highest of any transparent material. As a result, with the right cut angles, it's extremely easy to achieve total internal reflection as with the laser in the bucket. Diamond traps the light inside of it, which gives it an amazing sparkle. Would you be surprised if I told you that diamonds aren't actually rare? Well, because diamonds aren't actually rare. The myth of diamonds rarity stems from two sources. The first is that gem quality diamonds are rare. Fewer than 20% of mined diamonds are true gem quality. Combining quality with quantity, only about 1 in 1 million diamonds are quality 1 carat or larger. In contrast, you can buy a diamond tipped pen on eBay for about a dollar. Obviously, pens aren't made of gem quality diamonds, but they are diamonds nonetheless. The second and more dramatic reason why diamonds are believed to be rare is that gem quality diamonds are only rare in availability. We need a little history lesson to fully understand this concept. Before the mid-1800s, diamonds were extremely rare and were reserved only for royalty. However, a big diamond rush in South Africa flooded the world's supply and it killed the demand. Cecil Rhodes, the same Cecil Rhodes whom the Rhodes Scholarships in Rhodesia are named after, then bought up the entire diamond industry and formed his famous De Beers Diamond Company. With his monopoly, Rhodes essentially locked up all the diamonds in a safe, releasing only a few to market each year, making diamonds scarce and driving the prices upwards. De Beers controlled 90% of the world's rough diamond production when Rhodes died in 1902. In the 1930s, the same decade that the cheeseburger was invented, diamond prices fell and the whole diamond concept needed to be remarketed. An enormous marketing campaign ensued in an attempt to equate love with diamonds and how much you cared about your fiancé with carrots. Movie stars were shown everywhere with diamonds, and the famous saying, a diamond is forever, was pushed in 1947. On a quick aside, diamonds aren't actually forever. In reality, all diamonds are slowly turning into graphite. And just wait, in a little more than 10 billion years, we will all be proposing with wooden pencils. Diamonds have been strongly rooted in American culture since the engagement ring campaign, but practically no diamonds are produced there despite the fact that America buys more than 40% of the world's gem quality diamonds. If all the diamonds are being funneled into the states, where are they being funneled from? As a country, Russia produces the most diamonds in the world, but as a continent, Africa is a diamond central and owes a lot of its recent advancement to the stone. Botswana is just behind Russia in diamond production, and 40% of the country's revenue is attributed to diamond mining. Approximately $8.5 billion worth of diamonds come from African countries every year, and an estimated 10 million people are either directly or indirectly supported by the diamond industry. But the African diamond trade has a heart of darkness, which has brought just as much suffering as it has success. Remember Cecil Rhodes? After he became insanely rich off of diamonds, he became the Prime Minister of the Cape in 1890. He then passed the Glen Grey Act, which limited the amount of land that Africans could own, as well as another law which tripled the property qualification required to vote. In tandem, these laws made it essentially impossible for black Africans to vote, legitimized the idea of inequality amongst races, and essentially kick-started apartheid, which plied the country for half a century. Blood diamonds, also known as conflict diamonds, are another problem. They are defined as diamonds mined in a war zone and sold to finance and insurgency, in invading armies' war efforts, or a warlord's activities. Not only are blood diamonds profits used for destruction and death, but the miners take even bigger hits. These miners are often prisoners of war and forced to work like slaves as in the case with Sierra Leone in the 1990s. 
The average pay for a blood diamond miner is 7 cents, which means that if a miner works their entire life, then their child works their entire life, and then maybe their grandchild works their entire life, then maybe they might be able to afford a 1 carat diamond. But if a miner is even suspected of slipping a diamond into their pocket, they are met with either death or mutilation by machetes. All in all, 3 million deaths have been attributed to blood diamond mining. If it's any constellation, the chances of a diamond being bloody has dropped from its 15% peak in 1990 to 4% today. It's obviously still a problem, but at least steps are being taken in the right direction. America, the leading importer of diamonds, banned the importation of rough diamond from two of the most prevalent blood diamond exporters starting in 2001. The United Nations soon followed the United States when the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme was put into place in 2003. The Kimberley Process required every shipment of rough diamonds to be government certified, making it more difficult for blood diamond distribution. However, its effectiveness has come under fire in recent years because a certification doesn't necessarily guarantee clean diamonds. For example, a certification official in corrupt governments can be bribed for as little as $50 to issue faulty certifications. There is still room for improvement. Diamonds demand attention, and they become embedded not only in our rings, but also our culture. They have become the symbol of luxury and love. But what is the most expensive diamond ever? Clearly there must be some heavy hitters out there in this billion dollar industry. The Pink Star, mined in 1999 in South Africa by De Beers, took 20 months to cut and sold for $83.2 million in 2013 is a very good candidate. But I'm not talking about the most expensive diamond in the world. I'm talking about the universe. To answer this question, we need to travel 50 light years away to the dying star BPM 37093, fondly nicknamed Lucy, after the Beatles' hit song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. As Lucy fades away, her mass has compressed into a 10 billion trillion trillion carat heart the size of the moon. That's a 1 followed by 34 zeros. Let's try to put this into perspective with a very conservative estimation. If every one of Lucy's carrots sold for one dollar, she would be worth ten billion trillion trillion dollars. If every man, woman, and child on earth pooled their money together, they would have about twelve trillion dollars, or enough to buy 0.19001% of Lucy. Earth won't be affording or even traveling to Lucy anytime soon. But what about the Galactic Empire? An economic blog of students at Lehigh University estimates that it would cost $852 quadrillion worth of steel to construct a Death Star. With that number, Lucy is worth about 10 to the 16th Death Stars. Think about that. But that's a wrap on this abridged everything you can possibly know about diamonds. If I missed anything, please let me know in the comment section below and please share this video with anyone who might be interested in it. For my next video, I'm going to take a short break from my series on carbon and its allotropes to answer the question on everyone's mind, how fast are turtles? And I hope to see you then.